Hey everybody, welcome back to the Dungeon Dive. Daniel here. I hope you're doing well, and if you're not, I hope you are soon. Okay, today on the Dungeon Dive, we are going to take a look at a holy grail game of mine that I recently purchased, and that is Search for the Emperor's Treasure, and that is from Tom Wham, the designer of Mertwig's Maze, a game that I hold in pretty high esteem, a game that has influenced all of my kind of failed uh, failed attempts at creating a game. I've talked a little bit about that in my in the first designer diary I'm doing for my game, which is called A Land in Peril that I am designing now. But Mertwig's Maze was a huge inspiration on me and the kind of game that I've always wanted to make. Uh, Tom Wham's game, The Awful Green Things from Outer Space, was one of the first hobby games I ever purchased. And I had the green clamshell version of that, the little mini micro version. And I've always wanted this game, Search for the Emperor's Treasure. And I finally found a really nice copy in uh, a great condition and a very affordable. And that is from the best of Dragon Magazine games from TSR. Now, I didn't know up until just about a week ago that this game was printed both in Dragon Magazine, and that's how I, uh, that's the only version that I ever knew of. And that version is very, very hard to get, especially in a good condition at a good price. And I've only ever seen it really for sale a couple of times. But I recently discovered that there is a, a second edition, kind of an updated edition that was available in this Best of Dragon Magazine games. And this can be had for not a lot of money. And I think it has a couple of really cool games in this box set. Now we are going to take a look at Search for the Emperor's Treasure today. And then in the next episode of the Dungeon Dive, we will take a look at File 13. And this is another game designed by Tom Wham. But Search for the Emperor's Treasure on the back of this Dragon Magazine box here says that uh, travel the lands of Emperor Baldon, fighting monsters and exploring for treasure. When all of the Emperor's treasures are found, the player with the most riches wins. So Search for the Emperor's Treasure is a very simple game. And it was designed by Tom Wham to be kind of a simple substitute for a D&D style game. You know, if you got your friends together and you didn't want to take the time to play a full campaign or a full session of D&D one night, you could easily set up uh, the search for the Emperor's Treasure and have a small kind of simulated D&D experience. It has everything that you would want in a good adventure game. It has different characters such as Rocco the Dwarf, Turb the Magician, Rosa the Cleric, uh, Dulcimi the Magician, Nruff the Elf, Harold the Cleric, Kate the Fighter, and Alatha the Elf. And these characters are searching for treasure in this large hex map. This is the land that they are searching in with various named locations like the Midland Castle or the Flaming Demon, the Village of Moog, uh, the Mines of Zerta, or maybe you might discover a lost city here. And you are going out looking for treasure. Along the way, you are having various encounters like you might come across this wild boar or, hey, you might have to draw two encounters and face both of them. Uh, you might come across a griffin or maybe a, uh, who do we have here? We have the, these are so small, we have the giant rock. And uh, these creatures and these encounters that you come across, and when you draw one, depending on the terrain you were in, you might have to encounter them and maybe have a battle. Sometimes you can negotiate with them and you can um, entice them to join your adventuring party. Uh, some of these, there might be little side quests in this encounter pool where you'll draw a character such as uh, Maid Merwin here who wants to be escorted to a certain location. And that adds a little bit of a side quest and the main thing you are doing in this game is trying to locate treasure and you locate treasure by uh, gathering these treasure clues and each one of these clues tells you of a certain location on the map that you can find one of the emperor's treasures 
and the Emperor's treasures. There's a whole bunch of different treasures. A lot of these are just kind of victory points, things you need to win the game. But some of these might be magical weapons, like this magical mace here, which gives you a bonus to attacking. Uh, sometimes you might find imperial treasures, such as this uh, talisman here. When six of the imperial treasures are found, that triggers the end of the game, and then the player with the most treasure wins the game. Imperial treasures can also be taken up here to the imperial capital and traded in for more experience points if you are using the experience points variant. And I recommend using the experience points variant. Uh, whenever you defeat an encounter, you get experience points uh, based on the, the number of wounds that the encounter has. When you score 25 experience points, you can upgrade one of your uh, hero's abilities. And the heroes have three basic abilities. They have the ability score, the escape score, and the wound score. The ability score, that tells you how many dice you roll when you are in combat. So Osmo here, the fighter, rolls four dice in combat. If Osmo had any weapons that might add an ability, that might add an additional dice. So maybe uh, my magic mace here is, uh, adds two. So now my pool of dice is six. And now I would roll any five or a six becomes a success and does a wound. However, the magical mace allows any four, five, or six to become a success. So that would be two wounds on that attack. And then the enemies also have an ability score and they would do the same thing. It's a very simple game. I think Tom Wham kind of just, uh, it's like a reduction of the kinds of things we look for in adventure games. It has the barest essentials of what we need. So you will be questing for these clues. And then once you get a clue, that will tell you where you need to go to find one of those treasures. And again, as soon as the sixth Imperial treasure is discovered, the game is over. Let's take a little trip down memory lane and look at kind of the history of search for the Emperor's treasure. So this says, uh, this is written by Tom Wham. This is from his, his website. One of my favorites, which appeared in Dragon Magazine number 51 in July of 1981. The game was meant to be a board game version of Dungeons and Dragons. The wonderful original map was done by Darlene Pecole, and the lettering on it was done uh, late one night by Dave Trampier. Later, I revised this for West End. West End Games was a game publisher back in the day as a companion to Kings and Things. However, the project fell through and it had to wait a few years for its new incarnation. And that's what you're seeing on the board right now, this second edition. Uh, let's see here. Finally, Kim Mohan agreed to put out the new edition of Search for the Emperor's Treasure in a box set, The Best of Dragon Games. If you can find one on eBay, that is the version to play. It features many more encounters, an improved treasure gathering system, and best of all, if you cut it out, hex tiles so you can play on a different map each time. So Tom Wham's original design is he wanted this hex map to be individual hexes that you would build before playing the game. And so each game would have a different setup for the map. So as a compromise to get this game published in this best of dragon games, he divide, uh, he created this hex map, this permanent hex map for exploring. Now you could take all of these and cut them out, but I am keeping mine as it is. The original map from the Dragon Magazine version is very, very beautiful. It's more ornate, and I'm sure some people prefer this. I would love to have this as a big poster. Uh, this is a really, really well-designed map, and I can see this game being a lot of fun playing. This Tom, more Tom Wham style map with Tom Wham's graphics is uh, probably a little bit more of a practical map to use to play this kind of game. Now, if you're interested in the game and you can find this copy, I also recommend going to BGG and going to the file section and looking for these optional rules for search for the Emperor's treasure. And those are created by Jay McCracken. And this is a really nice document that adds some optional rules to it. And it also has some notes from Tom Wham about some errata and some of the changes. 
For instance, on the map here, the Vanishing Oasis uh, is called the Vanishing Oasis, but on the treasure, on the clue card, it's called the Wandering Oasis. So those are the same things. There are a few little changes that have been made over the years. There's a couple uh, pieces of errata for two of the characters, Rocco the Dwarf and Herman the Harefoot. And then in some of these um, uh, optional rules, Jay McCracken added some rules for buying and selling weapons and armor and also uh, some speeding up the game, a way to speed up the game. And then there is also this really handy reference sheet that tells you everything you need to play the game. So the game is relatively simple and kind of the main excitement, the main fun comes in when you draw one of these encounter chits. And the encounter chits, because they're tiny uh, little cardboard chits without a lot of room for information, when you draw one, you will um, you will refer to the encounter descriptions. Now, these were in the rule book, but I took the pages out and laminated mine. And so you will come across things like the black bear. Uh, black bears are rather common, cranky creatures that roam the country. They will attack anyone they meet. And then on each of the monster chits or each of the encounter chits, I should say, you will have an escape value. Uh, the higher the escape value, the harder it is for your hero to escape. And then they will have an ability score. And that is, again, how many D6 they roll when they attack you looking for fives or sixes for hits. And they will have a number of wounds. But sometimes you will come across things that are a little more um, ornate, such as this bottle imp. In the back of a cupboard in the basement of a deserted old house, you find this strange little bottle. Something tells you to keep it. Put it among your personal possessions. Later, you may release the imp from the bottle to do one of three things. So you can release the imp and you can. Uh, you may send the imp to help attack any other character who is having a hostile encounter. You can send the imp into combat either before the battle begins or after it is underway. As soon as it enters the battle, its ability score is added to that of the attacking creature. So this game does have a little bit of take that, a little take that element. Uh, plus, it takes wounds that otherwise would have been inflicted on the attacking creature and continues to absorb wounds until it is killed or runs away. Uh, two, you may use the imp to help you during a hostile encounter. So the imp can help you as a companion. It works for you the same way as described above. Or three, you may use the imp at any time to steal a treasure from another player. Pick the player the imp will steal from, who then turns all of the treasure and arms face down and mixes them up. Then you draw one randomly from the face down selection. The imp steals it and brings it back to you. But you can also find things like uh, brown bears or bullies, um, a demon, a desert rat, a dust storm, Ed the eagle, an elephant. Um, an elf princess who wants to be escorted to one of these locations. You can actually come across the emperor himself, Emperor Baldwin there, or an evil wizard, a giant rock, a great whale, a griffin, a holy man, a locust plague, the lost city. The lost city is a location that you have to discover as an encounter before you can get any treasure there. Uh, maybe a mad magician, a magic snail, Oliver J. Dragon, a pirate galley. If you are out at sea, then you have you might have some sea encounters with a giant whale or a, a pirate galley or maybe pirate raiders there. Uh, there is a pirate ship, a sea monster, skeletons, a unicorn, vampire, flying frogs, and a wild boar. So there are all kinds of different encounters you can have while you are playing. There are also a number of spells, and when you go into one of these named locations, like the Midland Castle, the Monastery, the Walled City, the Village of Scrab, you have to roll 2d6 and then look up on your exploration table to see what you find in one of those cities. Now, sometimes you might get uh, trapped in a dungeon, in which case you have to roll a 7 or higher to escape, or you can try to bribe the guards to escape. Sometimes the location uh, kicks you out and you must leave and you aren't, you aren't able to encounter that location. Sometimes you might find arms. Now, arms are various uh, weapons and armor that you can find. Basically, arms are, are shields and weapons. Some of the weapons will be uh, ranged weapons. Some of them will be melee weapons. And if you find a shield, shields can absorb a certain amount of damage uh, once per combat. 
So sometimes you will draw a random arm and you can add that to one of your characters or to one of your uh, your companions. Uh, sometimes you might find a boat or a ship and to you need a boat or a ship in order to travel along the sea spaces. And you can uh, travel along the sea spaces and one of the named locations is down here and that is a pirate layer. The reason I have this marker right now on this pirate layer is because my character Osmo the fighter, he came across Maid Merwin and Maid Merwin wants to be escorted to the pirate layer. Let's read a little bit about Maid Merwin here. Okay, so uh, Maid Merwin, uh, this noble lady, is abroad in search of her long-lost husband. Along the way, her retinue was murdered by a pirate raiding party, and her horses were stolen. It's pretty funny that she was, uh, her, her, her retinue was killed by pirates, and I rolled randomly on the chart to see where she wanted to go, and she actually wants to go to the pirate lair. So I'm playing that she wants, uh, she's hiring Osmo to go to that pirate lair to get revenge for her. Uh, when she arrives at her destination, she will thank you and reward you with two draws from the treasure pool. So that would be a, another chance to get some magical weapons or find one of those imperial treasures. Now, the two characters I'm playing at right now are... So I have Herman the Harefoot. He has an escape value of eight. He can take eight wounds before he dies. Right now, he has two wounds. He has an ability of two. He can use any armor or weapons, and he has no spells. However, he can dodge the first two wounds of each attack. And he has found an Imperial treasure. He has the Talisman. And he's also armed with a staff, which gives him a plus one to an ability. So his ability score is actually three. And he also he can also use that to absorb one, uh, one wound coming in. He has four treasure clues right now. So at the Lost City, he can find two treasures. Uh, he can trade a treasure for an arms chit at the Fragenberg. And he can also trade uh, one treasure, maybe trade it at the Monastery for an arms chit. And he can find one treasure at the Walled City. My other character right now is Osmo the Fighter. Has an escape value of 7, 13 wounds, an ability score of 4. He can use any arms or weapons uh, he can he has no spells right now he is armed with a magic mace which gives him a plus two to his ability and allows him to hit on four or fives or sixes instead of just fives or sixes he has a a round shield which can absorb two wounds and he has just one regular treasure a silver ingot which is basically a victory point towards the end of the game right now he has uh, two clues he can find a clue with a lost city, or he can exchange one of his arms chits at the pirate lair. Uh, perhaps when he escorts Maid Marwin there, he could actually end up getting three uh, treasures all in one turn. So that is really, really cool. He could discard this shield in order to get one of those additional treasures. Now I am playing with one house rule that I came up with in order to kind of speed up the game. And I think this would add a little bit of kind of a race element to the game. And that is to always have one global treasure available that the players can compete for. And my global treasure right now is at the Fragenberg. So if I come to the Fragenberg, I can also gather that Imperial treasure. The one thing we haven't taken a look at are the spell chits. So there are a number of spell chits and some of the characters will start with a certain number of spells. And then uh, those characters who have magical abilities they can meditate as part of their turn in order to gain more uh, more spells here. And when you meditate, you give up your movement and then you roll 2d6 and you look for the, uh, the total. So if you wanted to gather a speak to animals spell, then you would have to roll an eight or higher. But the cleric gives you a plus two to that roll. So uh, the speak to animal spells allow you to charm an animal encounter and then that animal can join you. And then there is also a friendship. And uh, if you use the friendship spell, you can charm a human encounter and then that encounter can join you. And as you gain more companions on your journey, you become stronger because they can attack for you uh, or in addition to you. And they can also take wounds and you can also give your companions uh, weapons and armor in order to make them stronger. So right now, uh, Herman here, he is heading to the uh, Fragenberg. And up here we have Osmo. Osmo needs to make his way to the pirate layer in order to... Uh, 
to uh, complete Maid Merwin's quest. And if I ever deviate from a direct route to the pirate layer, Maid Merwin will leave my retinue. And so I need to come over to the coast. Now Osmo needs to come over to the coast in order to try to find a ship so he can set sail to the pirate layer. So on your turn, you can move and you can move along a road. You can move three spaces as long as all of those spaces are on a road or you can move to one adjacent hex. And again, you have to have a bow in order to move into the seas. But right now, Herman is in the mountains here and he just wants to move one space into Fregenberg. So he moves into Fregenberg as his movement. And then he wants to look at his treasure uh, clues to see if he has anything that he can do there. He can trade uh, one treasure may be found at Fregenberg in exchange for an arms chit. But he only has this uh, staff here. And so I think he's going to keep that. However, there is a global, uh, again, a house rule, a global treasure can be found at Fregenberg. So he is just going to claim that uh, that world treasure there and we'll mix up the pool of treasures and we will draw one and let's see what we get. We get a treasure, a gold cup. So that's just a normal treasure that counts as one victory point at the end of the game. And now we need to have an encounter at Fragenberg. So we will roll 2d6 and we rolled a five there. And now we, let's see where we are here. We are at a castle or a burg. Okay, so we rolled a five. Okay, so we can draw an arms or a boat. Um, let's see here, I think. Well, let's draw an arms because if we have, if we have an extra arms that we can trade, then on his next turn, Fre uh, Herman could actually trade that for a treasure. So let's see here, we'll mix up the, the arms and we will draw an arms and what do we get? Uh, we find a shield. Okay, so we find a kite shield. This kite shield can be used to absorb three points of damage and that can be done every single combat. Not every turn, but in every combat. Okay, so that was uh, Herman's turn there. So now it's Osmo's turn and Osmo needs to head over here to try to get a boat so he can go to the pirate lair and he can move three spaces along a road. All named spaces are said to be roads as well. So he can go one, two, three. Okay, so now Osmo was in the mountains. So now it's time to see what kind of encounter he might have. So let's draw one of these encounter chits here. And what do we get? Uh, we find a unicorn. Okay, so this unicorn is only in a forest, so we would discard that. Let's see if we can draw something that is in the mountains here. What do we have here? A sea, swamp, or a coast. Okay, we are along the coast, so this is a fish fiend. Let's read a little bit about the fish fiends and see what they're all about. Okay, fish fiends. This horrid carnivorous fish has the ability to climb out of the water in search of a meal. It views everyone it encounters as dinner and it is always hungry. Okay, so you can't negotiate with this uh, fish fiend. It has no treasure. It has an ability of five, seven wounds and an escape value of seven. So it's a good idea if, if you're not playing with the experience um, house rule or the experience variant, I should say. It's a good idea to usually try to, uh, to, to escape from creatures that don't offer any kind of treasure. But because we are dealing, uh, working with the experience variant, uh, Osmo will enter combat. The first thing you do in combat is you determine how many rounds of ranged combat there are before the characters meet in melee combat. And to do that, you roll 2d6 and look at the difference. Okay, so four and four, there is no ranged combat. Now, if this was five and four, there would be one round of ranged combat before melee combat. And if any of the combatants had a ranged ability, they could use that before uh, the combatants meet in melee combat. But let's move straight to melee combat. Now, the uh, swamp creature or the uh, fish fiend here has an attack value of five. And so we'll take 5d6 and we will roll those to see how many uh, hits Osmo takes and successes are a five or a six. And we have one five. Okay, so one wound goes to Osmo. Osmo has his round shield, so I can apply one of those wounds to the round shield. And remember that shield can absorb two points of damage per combat. And now it's time for Osmo's attack. Osmo has an ability of four. So that's 4d6 and then the mace gives him two more 
And because the mace is magic, I hit on four up. Uh, one, two, three, four. Oh man, what a great hit. So I do four points of damage to that sea creature. So we'll put a four there. Now that that round of combat is over, I can either escape or I can continue attacking. Okay, so now the, uh, the fish fiend would attack me again with his ability score of five. And uh, no hits again. Wow, very lucky. Osmo is getting incredibly lucky. I only need one more hit on Osmo. So I'm uh, pretty sure I will do that with... Um, no, look at that. All misses. Wow, that was a, a very uneventful round of combat. They're swinging their swords. The fish fiend is dodging. Osmo is dodging. Now we're at another round of combat. And ooh, look at that, two hits to Osmo. So Osmo's shield can absorb one of those and his mace can absorb the other. So Osmo's pretty well kitted out here. And now we're just looking for a single four or five or six for Osmo and there he hits it. And now the fish fiend is dead. So the fish fiend is dead. He has no treasure, so I don't get anything for that. But actually he's seven wounds. That's right, seven wounds. Uh, how many did he have? Four, five, six. So he actually has six wounds now. I forgot, I thought that said five. Okay, so there's actually going to be one more round of combat. Okay, so let's see if the fish fiend hits again, and that is two more hits. So the mace can absorb one more hit, and then one hit goes towards Osmo. So Osmo has one wound now. and He can take 13 before he's knocked out. And then I just need one more hit to uh, kill this fish fiend, and there we have it. Okay, so I think that was right. But now he has taken all seven of his wounds and uh, he gets discarded back into the pool. And because he had seven wounds, Osmo would get seven experience points. So Osmo has five experience points right now. So I'll add seven. Bring him up to 12 and Herman has 11. And so you're looking for 25 XP in order to, uh, to upgrade one of your character's abilities. And so that's basically the game there. Uh, you move, you have an encounter, you look at the encounter chit, you find out what the encounter does. And again, there are all kinds of super cool encounters like this evil wizard here. Nobody knows where they came from, but evil wizards seem to be the root of the emperor's problems. They cruise the land mounted on hideous flying reptiles, seeking magic items in general but imperial, imperial treasures most of all. Now, one thing, if you have an imperial treasure and you do come across one of the imperial guards or the imperial patrol or the imperial navy, there is a chance that they will confiscate that treasure for you. So when you have an imperial treasure, it's a really good idea to go to the imperial city and hand that back to the emperor, take the treasure back to its rightful owner. I guess the emperor came by it, uh, um, came by it <laughs> in goodwill. But uh, see, so when you draw this encounter chip for the evil wizard, it does not automatically apply to you. The wizard will always seek out the character with the most imperial treasure. Roll dice to resolve ties. If no character has an imperial treasure, the wizard will seek out the one with the most magical treasures. If no character has any imperial treasures or magic treasures, the wizard flies away in disgust. In disgust. If you are the one confronted by the evil wizard, you must either give up all magical treasures in your possession or fight the wizard. And the wizard uh, has four dice. He hits on a four plus. He has 16 wounds and a nine to escape. That is a pretty powerful um, uh, encounter there. He, however, so his negotiation to negotiate, you can give up your Imperial treasures and have him leave. So yes, there are cool encounters. There are neat things to do. This game is absolutely charming. It's super simple. You're just moving, uh, rolling uh, for an encounter or drawing from an encounter, looking for those treasures, trying to get the various uh, weapons and armor to make your characters more powerful. And this really is a distilled adventure game. Uh, the essence of the adventure game is distilled down to its core elements. And that is one thing I really appreciate. And in kind of a retconned way or in kind of a, a retroactive way, I uh, this game is kind of uh, now an inspiration on me 
for my own game. I like how much this game does with its simple mechanisms. And it really does give me this feeling that I am out exploring a land, having cool adventures, having cool encounters, and finding cool things. So yeah, if you can find a copy of Search for the Emperor's Treasure, I do uh, recommend it. And I think I got this, this box, uh, the Best of Dragon magazine. I think I got mine for like 40 bucks and it was uh, practically new. I had to punch everything out. And I am very happy with that purchase, especially because I do get that other Tom Wham game, File 13. And there's actually a boxing game in the game in the box that also I think looks really interesting. So, all right, you guys. Well, I hope you enjoyed this look at Search for the Emperor's Treasure, and we will talk to you later. Bye bye.